Hello, today we're continuing in our GCSE Physics Revision series looking at the heart, ECG and pulse oximetry. If you're doing biology you need a much more detailed picture of the heart, but from a physics point of view the heart is simply a pump which consists of four chambers. And this wall should be absolutely fixed, nothing passes between the one side and the other side across this vertical division. The top half is called the atrium and the atrium and the bottom half is called the ventricle and you have a left and a right ventricle but when you draw a picture of the heart it's always the other way around so the left is on this side and the right is on this side because what you are pretending you're doing is looking at a person who is standing facing you and obviously if someone's facing you the left side of their heart is on this side and the right side of their heart is on this side. So we've got the right and left atrium and we've got the right and left ventricle. And the way it works is that blood comes into the uh, right atrium from your body and generally speaking it has very little oxygen because all the oxygen has been used um, to give you energy. The atrium then pumps the blood into the right ventricle and the right ventricle then pumps the blood to the lungs where um, the blood supply will be replenished with oxygen. That replenished blood with oxygen now comes into the left atrium where it is pumped into the left ventricle where it is then pumped around the body. And then when it's gone all the way around the body it comes back into the right atrium. So essentially what the heart is doing is it's pumping a small pump as it were to get the blood from the atrium into the ventricle and that happens on both sides. And then you need a fairly big pump that pumps blood on this side to the lungs to be reoxygenated and this side all around the body so that it provides the oxygen you need to create the energy for life. So if you look at a heartbeat on an oscilloscope what you'll typically find is there's a small time of rest but then you get an action which we call P action um, that is where the atrium is pumping the blood into the ventricle then another little pause before you get the main action which is the ventricle action where the blood is being pumped either to the lungs, or both actually, to the lungs on one side and to the body on the other side. And then another small pause before the ventricle relaxes. And that is the complete process of one heartbeat. An atrium push into the ventricle, the ventricle push into the either lungs or body, in fact both, and then the ventricle relaxes. And then the whole thing starts again with the P, and then the QRS and then the T. So if you're looking at an oscilloscope with a properly functioning heart that is the sort of pattern that you should see and the time between let's say two of the ventricle actions that time which we'll call delta T that is actually the time between two beats of the heart and normally it varies of course but normally you would expect a healthy person to have a heartbeat of about 70 beats per minute which means that delta T is going to be something like 0.86 seconds so just under one second between any two consecutive heartbeats but clearly if you've been doing a lot of exercise or you're, you've, you've used a lot of energy your heart will beat faster if you're sleeping or you're relaxing your heart might be slightly slower an electrocardiogram or ECG actually records this electrical uh, activity in your heart. Metal electrodes are placed on your heart and on other parts of your body and that records the detail of this pattern of your heartbeat and gives the medical profession an idea of any irregularities. Next we move on to pulse oximetry. A pulse is something that you can detect in the body if you have an artery 
flowing, well, arteries are the things that carry the blood out from the heart and veins are things that take the blood back. Generally speaking, the arteries have got oxygenated blood, veins have got less oxygen in them because the blood, because the oxygen has been given up. So you want an artery that's moving away from the heart, close to a bone. And then if you put your finger on that artery, you feel a regular pulse. What is that regular pulse? It is, of course, the um, pumps that are coming from the heart. The heart is pushing out the blood in pump loads, if you like. Every time the, the ventricle pushes the blood out, you get a little pressure wave. And what you're actually measuring is the pressure wave that is caused by the heart as the blood, as it were, moves through in, uh, in little pulses, um, reflecting the fact that the ventricle is pushing out a small amount every time the heart beats. And you're able to detect that with your finger. But in hospital, they don't necessarily worry about all of that. They might put a pulse oximeter on you. And the typical place to put it is on your own finger. Sometimes they put it on your earlobe. But the idea is that if you go in, sometimes they'll just clip a little device on the end of your finger. And what it's doing is firstly, it will have some kind of pressure sensitive device, which will measure that pulse and that will be displayed on a oscilloscope. That's quite straightforward. But it's not only your pulse that it's measuring, it's also measuring the extent to which there is oxygen in your blood. And that's a little bit more clever because the blood will be flowing through an artery and then it will be coming back through a vein. Blood is usually 97% saturated with oxygen. So if it's significantly less than that, there may be a problem. How does the oximeter measure? Well, it takes advantage of the fact that the oxygen in the blood is carried in a thing, a protein called hemoglobin. And there are two types of hemoglobin. There is oxyhemoglobin and there is reduced hemoglobin. And the point about these is that they absorb infrared or visible light. And the extent of that absorption depends on how much oxygen they're carrying. The oxyhemoglobin absorbs infrared. The reduced hemoglobin tends to absorb visible light. They do each absorb the other types, but they principally absorb, in the case of oxyhemoglobin, infrared, and the case of reduced hemoglobin, visible light. So what you've got is essentially two light generators in the pulse oximeter. One generates visible light and one generates infrared light. And that passes through your finger and is measured at a detector, which detects how much that light has been absorbed as it's passed through the bloodstream. And depending on how much it has been absorbed, determines how much oxygen there is in the oxy hemoglobin or in the reduced hemoglobin, because you're looking at two different types of absorption of different uh, types of light. So that's a very clever way of getting information. Typically, you use light emitting diodes. You, you will use 650 nanometers, which is a wavelength in the visible light region. And for um, Infrared, you will use 950 nanometers, which is a wavelength in the infrared region. The longer wavelength, shorter frequency, is the infrared. And you have two different detectors which measure the extent of the, the absorption, and that will tell you how much oxygen there is in the blood.